we're all set. Thank you. All right, so I can proceed, Melissa? Yes, please do. All right, well, hello, everyone. I may have missed the introduction, for which I apologize, but again, I'm Brian Montgomery, and I'll be the, well, I am the chairperson for Unified Bocce, and uh, what tonight will serve as is a review of the rules of Bocce, and once I'm finished with reviewing those, Melissa will hop back on and go over the form requirements that everyone will need to fulfill. So we can get started. <clears throat> okay, so the court size of Bashi is uh, 60 feet long and 12 feet wide. And as you can see in the diagram, we have court markings um, noted by the lines that you see going across and then the elevated markings, which the cones will serve as. And the markings break down into um, those lines that you see closest to the end, which are the foul lines. The dotted lines that you see are for anyone who may need use of a ramp. Um, so the foul line is extended an additional 10 feet from the end board for those who are in need of a ramp. And then you have the half court line. And the bocce balls come in sets of four. Um, so four will be one color, four will be a different color. Usually those two colors are red and green, and then you have a smaller yellow or white ball, which is the Polina, which is served as the target ball. So <clears throat> roster and lineup composition. So to field a bocce team, you need a minimum of four players, and you can have a maximum of eight players. If you have a maximum of eight players, then you're allowed to have two additional players to serve as substitutes. Um, those two substitutes, one must have a disability, and then the other must be without a disability. So you couldn't have two student athletes of like roles serving as your substitutes. So we strongly encourage that uh, at least 50% of your roster um, is comprised of students with intellectual or any other type of disability and then the remaining members should be students that do not have any disability. Um, the nature of Special Olympics is to foster a true inclusive environment and in order to do so there must be a minimum of two students with disabilities and two students without disability on each team's roster. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Teams that feel less then the required four will forfeit any match, and a team, again, cannot fill more than eight. When you do play your matches, each player of like role, whether it be athlete or partner, will have um, or should have equal throwing opportunities during each match, so there shouldn't be a disproportionate number of roles that any one or more particular athletes have than their teammates. And we'll get into a little bit of this on uh, some proceeding pages with diagrams. Um, any team that has four players as the minimum, then each of those players will always roll a ball um, each frame. And I'll take it to the maximum. If your team is fielding a maximum of eight players, then what happens is four are assigned to one end and four are assigned to the other end. In the case that it's more than four and less than eight, let's say six for example, four will begin a frame while the other two wait on the other end. Once that first frame is completed, then two of the four players will rotate to the opposite end um, as shown in the diagram. If that's the case, in order to fulfill the equal throwing opportunity mandate, when you rotate players, the same players shouldn't rotate all of the time. So what I mean is, and I use this example of six players um, for frame one. So A, B, C, D, E, and F are all on the same team. And the way it works is in frame one, players A, B, C, and D will each row. At the conclusion of that frame, then 
players A and B will rotate to the opposite opposite end. And for frame two now, A, B, and then E, F, who were already waiting on the opposite end, they would roll. For frame three, you would not want A and B to rotate back, as that would begin to give them a disproportionate number of rows. So what you would do is you would actually rotate E and F, and you would continue to do that in the manner which gives everybody an equal opportunity to roll the bocce balls. <clears throat> So a note on substitution. So with substitutions, again, if you have a maximum of eight players, you are allowed to have two substitutions. Um, it cannot be the case that where you have less than eight and you provide subs. For example, if your team has six players on it, all six must play. You cannot have it to where four of those six players plays and then two serve as substitutions. Substitutions are permitted when you have a maximum of eight players. And then these are the following parameters. So the players with the lowest assessment scores, again, that's something that we'll get into later, should roll in the first frame. Um, and this is in an effort to prevent any coach from disguising anyone as a ringer. Substitutes may only be designated for eight teams, again. And when you sub, it must be a player of like role. So if you have an athlete that's a sub, and then the partner that's a sub, when each of those student athletes rotate in, it must be for someone of a like role. So an athlete must sub for an athlete and a partner sub for a partner. Only one substitute per role will be allowed per team. So once an athlete subs for an athlete, then the athlete who subbed out may not sub back in. Once the substitution is made, then that's it, and it goes uh, the same for the partners. What we encourage is that substitutes, substitutions be made halfway through the match, so whether that's halfway in terms of expiration or progression of time, so if the match is 30 minutes, uh, we suggest making the rotation 15 minutes into the match, um, or halfway in terms of points. So when a team has scored eight points with eight points, which is halfway to the sixteen point total that ends the game. Um oh, I wanted to say that I apologize. So once a player is substituted for, again, they may not re enter except for in the case of an emergency and that still has to be approved by whomever the competition manager is at that time. Again, the length of the matches should be 16 total points or a recommendation of 30 minutes, whichever one comes first. For your individual season matches, if for whatever reason you did need to modify that time if it was too long, the only thing we say is that we recommend that they do not be um, reduced lower than 20 minutes. If in the event at the conclusion of 30 minutes or whatever the set time is, both teams are tied, then one additional frame will be um, contested in order to break the tie. Sequence of play. So, <clears throat> again, one team has a set of green balls and one team will have a set of red balls. And all eight of these balls are rolled or tossed in an underhand delivery. Now, what we mean by underhand is that the hand does not come above waist level. The only exceptions to that is any physical disabilities or limitations that a particular student athlete may have. And um, I'll touch on this again with a diagram in a little bit. And the player must stand behind the foul line when delivering his or her bocce ball and the Polina. So if you look at the diagram, you see the figure where the player's feet is what is uh, used to dictate if they're in the correct position or not, not the actual hand. The hand may crawl so you can get as close to the line as you want to without touching, without touching the actual line. So at the beginning of the match, a coin flip will determine which team rolls the Polina first, which is the target ball. Um, 
once that's determined, then the first player from that team that wins the coin toss enters the bocce court and they attempt to roll the Polina, which must go past the mid court line but stop before the foul line on the opposite end. So if you look at the diagram, the yellow shaded area is where the Polina must go. If it stops before that, um, it's an unsuccessful attempt. And if it goes beyond that, it's an unsuccessful attempt. In the event that it is an unsuccessful attempt, the official will allow that player two more attempts and in the event that after the third time it's still an unsuccessful attempt, then a player from the opposite team will have the opportunity to roll the Polina and place it. If the opposite team's placement of the Polina is successful, they are to exit the court and the team who had uh, the opportunity first to roll the Polina enter, re-enters the court to roll the first bocce ball. So sometimes that can be a little bit confusing. So one more time, you do not lose your advantage of rolling first if in the event you don't roll the Polina um, successfully after three attempts. What happens is after three unsuccessful attempts, the other team gets a chance to place the Polina. And if it's successful, then the original team who had the advantage um, has the opportunity or is to come back onto the court and roll the first bocce ball. If that attempt is unsuccessful, then the official will place the Polina at the midpoint of the opposite foul line. <clears throat> so in terms of sequence of rolls, what happens is after the first bocce ball is rolled, so say red is rolled first, then that player exits the court and a player from the opposite team entered the court to roll their first bocce ball. Once two bocce balls have been rolled, one apiece from each team, um, sequence of play is determined by proximity of the bocce balls to the Polina. So um, the best way to remember it is <coughs> um, if you're the red team, uh, the terminology that I find most, you know, or easiest to use is green closer red rolls and that basically means whichever team has a ball closest to the polina it's the other team's go so if the red ball is closest to the polina then the terminology is red closer green roll and if you can remember that then <laughs> then you'll be good to go sometimes there's some confusion with that so one more time sequence of play is dictated by Whichever team is closer to the ball, whichever team is closest to the ball is the other team's role. Um, in the event that all four, in the event that all four, uh, I'm sorry, getting the call. In the event that all four balls are rolled for one team, so say you know you have one green ball on the court and it's closest to the Polina, so all four red balls are rolled as the green ball remains closer then you'll just have three green balls left and those are of course rolled consecutively. Once all eight balls are rolled, the official determines the number of points earned. And the way this works, remember that during each frame, only one team, at the conclusion of each frame, only one team is awarded the points. So two teams will not be awarded, both be awarded point at the end of a frame. Um, at the end of the, of the frame, the official determines first which color is closest to the Polina. So in the diagram, you have the red ball, the two red balls being closest to the Polina. So the red team would score two points. So again, only one team scores during each frame and the number of points that they get is dictated by the number of balls that that team has closer than any uh, or than the closest ball of the other team. So um, in this diagram, you see that those two red balls that are on, um, on that line, that circular line, are both closer than the closest green ball. So red would score two points. So the maximum amount of points that you can score during each frame is four 
and the minimum amount of points that you can score during each frame is one. So you'll be scoring anywhere from one to four points. The number of points is dictated by the number of balls that are closest to the Polina than the closest ball of the opposing team. <clears throat> so earlier I touched on legal throws. Both of these are examples of legal throws. If you see the release point for both of these student athletes are waist level or below. Um, anything that's above waist level will be considered a foul. And this also goes with stepping on the line. Any ball that's released that's a foul ball will be considered dead. And what that means is the official that's officiating the game, um, if they can do so in a safe manner, they'll stop the ball and just remove it from the court and consider that ball dead. And I'm referring to the bocce ball. So let's say uh, student A rolls the ball and they either step on the line or it's an illegal throw. The official, if it can be done so in a safe manner, steps onto the court and stops the ball and removes it. Any event that the official cannot get to at the time or do it in a safe manner, the ball can roll, and if it does not affect any other balls, whether that be a bocce ball or a palina, then you can just, or the official can just pick it up and remove it. If it does um, change the position of any balls, then it's to be picked up and removed, and then the other balls, again, whether they're bocce balls or palinas, are to be repositioned um, as best as possible to their original position before the foul ball was rolled. In the event that a bocce ball, I'm sorry, a Polina leaves the court. So let's say the Polina is in play and the teams are rolling bocce balls and somehow the Polina gets hit and exits the court, then that frame, that whole frame is considered dead. No points are awarded and a new frame is, um, is, is started. As far as the grips, um, that diagram shows the grips. You can roll the ball with either, either an underhand grip or an overhand or AKA inverted grip. Either is legal. And then these are the examples of the foul line. So you can see <clears throat> the legit positioning on the first diagram and then the next two uh, represents what would be considered foul. So if you step over the line, um, as you see to the far right, that would be considered a foul, and if you step on the line but not over the line, it's still a foul. So that's important to remember. A lot of times, student athletes will, you know, step on the line and think that they're still good, and they're actually not. And again, the committing the penalty for committing a foul or a foul line uh, penalty is a dead ball. <coughs> Teams are allowed to hit the sideboards and the end boards with their bocce balls, whether uh, you know on purpose or not on purpose, but they are legal rolls. Additional details. So in the event that you have two balls to the visible eye that seem equal distance to the Polina and they are the two closest balls, then uh, the official would have to measure, and this provides the proper method for measuring. So with your measuring tape, what you would want to do is you would want to take the end of the measuring tape and put it on the side and center of the bocce ball facing the polina, and then you would take the measuring tape and run it through the top of the polina. So in in far distances, this usually takes two people, so whether that's two coaches or two officials, um, it takes uh, two people to do so. Um, so one person would be standing where the red bocce ball is, and they would have the end of the tape on the side and in the center. And then the second, uh, second person would measure and stretch the tape across the top of the polina. Uh, for the for the correct measurement. In the event excuse me, my 
So um, I apologize. There are many types of ramps that are used, and the rule with a ramp is that a player can push the bocce ball on their own. So no device can be used that actually provides force to the bocce ball. The player is the person that's responsible for providing the force, and then that ramp must not extend past that dotted um, foul line. In terms of the standard foul line that has no bearing on where the player stands, um, they'll be ruled by the dotted foul line. In terms of coaching or instructional assistance for a teammate, once a player enters the bocce court, then they are not allowed to receive any instruction of any kind, whether that be from a coach or a teammate. And that's very important. Um, of course, in the heat of competition, we all, um, again, want to coach our kids. But you have to remember as coaches that once a player enters the court, they are not to receive any instruction. So what I would always do as a coach is, if a player, because a lot of times a player will step onto the court and then look to you as you're outside the court to seek instruction. So you have to train them that if you're going to need instruction, you must ask for it before you enter the court. Um, so make sure they're aware of that. And then make sure the teammates are aware of that because just because you're not saying anything, sometimes a teammate will um, – coach from outside the court, which is, again, not allowed. In the event that uh, a player may need assistance due to a visual disability of, or, or anything of the sort, then uh, a, a teammate can, we encourage it to be a teammate that uh, provides a visual cue by either standing behind the Polina on the court, or you can use audio cues, whether that be um, a bell or a sound device to help any player with that type of disability. Um, what we encourage is that if anybody on your team will need an accommodation that is discussed with the competition manager and the opposing coach before matches um, commence. And this was a very important when it came up in the, the previous state tournament. So checking the positions of the point. So in between a wild frame is being played, one player from each team may proceed down the outside of the court before he or she delivers uh, his or her bocce ball in order to ascertain, you know, whatever strategy they want to use. But we're discouraging that we don't allow, like, the whole team to walk down the side of the court or to actually walk on the court and then walk down. Um, so, again, the rule of that is one person can walk down the side of the bocce court in order to um, assess uh, the current uh, positioning of the bocce balls. <clears throat> Excuse me. So here's where you see the coach's box, um, but uh, I think – we're pretty good on um, addressing that. So only one player can be on the court at a time in the event that someone needs help or assistance with accessing the court. Of course, that's different. So if you have um, a student athlete who may need to access the court via a wheelchair, then you can have teammates disconnect the court and lift the court up and provide you know, assistance were needed or a ramp, of course, then someone, an additional person can come and set up the ramp. Again, these are all things that should be discussed with the competition manager and the opposing coach before uh, the matches commence. Um, in the event that a student athlete needs help with self-balance, a coach uh, or player or team, I should say, can provide help, but you must be careful not to actually provide instruction or assist with that person's throw in any form or fashion. And, of course, in the spirit of sportsmanship, 
um, we want teams to come together, congratulate each other on a good match, and shake hands. And this is the principle of meaningful involvement. It's pretty self-explanatory with Bocce. Everybody rolls their own ball. Um, the biggest key point for meaningful involvement in Bocce, again, is everyone getting the same or equal amount of rolls. And when it is a person's turn to roll, um, they don't receive um, illegal coaching, which means they're in the box, and or if they're using uh, a ramp or if they need help with physical balance, then no one is actually doing it for them. They're doing it themselves. So here's the 2017 rule change. And in the past, um, this has to do with the initial placement of the Polina. One requirement in addition to it passing the half court line and stopping before the um, foul, foul line is that it needed to be 12 inches from the sideboard. So in the past, what would happen is if it's rolled and it rests up against the sideboard after the initial placement or upon the initial placement, then the official would just move it 12 inches from the sideboard. However, due to the, uh, the composition and, and the density of the bocce ball, that rule is not necessary. So in the event that that happens, then it can come to a rest because it doesn't have that same uh, ricochet ability. So that's the one rule change, the only rule change you need to be concerned with for 2017. In this document is uh, this scorecard, so you can print a few out and make copies for all of your matches. And here you'll find the uniform requirements. The biggest thing with this is uh, you do want uniformity um, and you want the uniform to be school issued. So don't want you know student athletes just coming in their own clothes. A few hiccups that we've seen that I would like to touch on. The most frequent one frequent one is at the state tournament, um, students had uh, sometimes would have boots and they would have jeans on. So they had to be, you know, removed from competition, and it's all outlined or detailed in here um, until those issues were corrected. And if I'm missing anything, you know, Melissa will back me up on it. But that's pretty much the rules in terms of headgear. Um, it's not allowed, no hats, no brim hats. Um, you can wear wristbands, headbands, but they should be solid color. Uh, Brian, just one correction there. I'm sorry if it didn't reflect yep. this in the guide. Um, uh, hats with uh, a rim are allowed in outdoor bocce. So I apologize if uh, again oh, it doesn't reflect I that. I apologize. That's my apologies. So I believe that's it for uniforms. <clears throat> So the player assessments, um, the player assessments is what will be used to give an overall indication of each team's collective skill level, and we use those to see the outdoor bocce tournament. So, and I'll go over the form in a minute, and Melissa will touch on all forms a little bit later again. But um, they're to be. They're not to be conducted before Monday, April 3rd. So with your team assessments, it's something that you will do in practice and you'll have to do for every player that's on your roster. And the procedure for it is, I want to show you the picture. So for each stu student athlete on your team, what you would do is you would place the Polina in the middle point of each of the shown spots. So a spot at the 30-foot line, the 40-foot line, and the 50-foot line. And they would roll all eight bocce balls. So you would start, I'm sorry, you would start with spot number one. Roll all eight bocce balls. You don't have to measure all eight, but you roll all eight. And you measure the closest the three closest bocce balls to the polina. So again, you set the polina at the spot 
then you measure all three of the closest ball to, balls to the pelina, excuse me, um, and you'll record them on a sheet that you'll see in a minute. Once you <clears throat> do spot one, then you will have that same student athlete com completed for spot number two. And if uh, fatigue is an issue at all, you can, you know, rotate players after their eight rows, but you want to collect the three best scores for each spot for each of your student athletes. And those scores will be recorded. I apologize, it's turned sideways, but those scores will be recorded on this sheet, which we call the post registration form. So if you see the example, Joe Smith, he rolled his three closest ball at the 30 foot spot were 24, 9, and 20. Then you can see it for the 40 and the 50 foot. And then that's his total score if you are to add those up. So each team on your roster should be listed on this sheet and you should have an assessment score for each one and then a team average. And you will use this, which we'll speak about later. You will use this information um, as a part of your paperwork to submit, but also a Google Excel document will be populated and in that document, you'll be um, inputting just your team averages. But again, we'll speak more on that later. So again, you will need this for each person on your team, including anybody that's designated as substitutes. So here's the season timeline. You could have already begun practice as this date for spring sports was March 1st for MPSSAA. Um, first play date can be March 21st, so we're uh, exactly two weeks out from that. In terms of forms, um, these are the due dates, but I'll turn it over to Melissa um, to review the forms. Melissa, do you want to hop in now? Yes, thank you, Ryan. Um... If you wouldn't mind scrolling down just a bit, I'll, I'll yeah. allow for the controls okay. to remain. Um, Do you want me to leave it on the deadline sheet it. or go past? Uh, yeah, if you could scroll to the um, right here, the application for participation. I um, wanted to clarify with everyone, um, for many of the schools participating, this is actually the second or even third season in which you're participating with the Interscholastic Unified Sports Program. Um, the document, um, which is a screenshot on this page, is the application for participation. So this is the student athlete form. We need to collect one of these from each of the student athletes in each and every season in which they participate um, for all intents and purposes through our um, insurance provider and such. Um, we need to collect that. It acts as a permission slip for mom and dad to participate. So um, we are also aligning our expectations with the MPSSA, which also uh, collects a permission slip with each and every season. So we appreciate your cooperation in doing that. Um, if there are hardships, um, the rare hardship at home, um, we run into um, anything and everything from time to time, such as um, student athletes who um, do not have or are wards of the state, perhaps. Um, anything of the sort. If you're if you're running into roadblocks and you can't collect one, please do communicate with your district representative and uh, she or he will get in touch with our office and let us know. Um, so please do um, collect one from everyone. Um, as well, the format of the form uh, was revised a bit uh, beginning in the fall season. So with that, we made it a little bit more functional. Uh, we like to think, um, and then also some of the disabilities are classified um, differently per Special Olympics Incorporated. So um, for the purposes of BACHI, uh, we simply designate persons in two roles, um, a person with a disability, be it intellectual, physical, or otherwise, and a person without a disability. For those of you who have been around um, um, in previous seasons, you will also hear unified part the term unified partner. IEP 504, so that's a person with a disability other than intellectual. So um, you may hear that term from time to time. An athlete is a person with an intellectual disability and a unified partner 
as a person without a disability whatsoever. Uh, one last point in going over this form specifically is that please do, you are at the front lines collecting this from the hands of student athletes and or mom and dad um, or their uh, guardians. So please do um, ensure that the form is completed in its entirety. Uh, we don't want to have to go back to you time and time again um, to collect contact information, be it a, a phone number, um, disability classifications, and then as well the red box there <clears throat> is in fact a question that we are required by Special Olympics Incorporated to ask and that is um, has the student been um, charged or convicted of any criminal offense. Um, again, that is a requirement from our higher-ups. Um, it is a question that has appeared on all of the forms since the inception of this program in 2009. So we do appreciate you ensuring that that is, is um, answered. Please do know uh, with all certainty and echo this to anyone who, who asked the question that an answer of yes does not necessarily um, exclude or preclude someone from, from participating. We simply want to make sure we are um, providing the safest environment for all participants um, and we need to know if that is in fact um, something that we need to consider and we would go to the means of perhaps providing one-to-one -one chaperones and such to make sure that everyone is safe. Um, likewise there at the end we need an autograph from the participant uh, and then as well from the parent or guardian. And please do um, uh, shockingly enough, the date of the signature um, is commonly missed, so please make sure that that date is uh, uh, completed as well. And we will collect these, so it's good to have just a whole stack, a batch of them, and the best means we found is for them to all be scanned and emailed to your regional sports director, uh, no, excuse me, your district representative in the absence of a district representative, then it would go to your Special Olympics Maryland Regional Sports Director. Brian, if you could go on to the next page. Please. Yep. Um, the Affirmation of Eligibility form is a three-page document, um, and this is the basically an account of all of the applications of participation that you have collected. So it's, it's basically a roster that you fill out, it is um, our opportunity also to um, have you attest that all of the student athletes who are listed on this document have completed the necessary um, expectations both by the, their respective school system and then Special Olympics Maryland. So many school systems, I think all school systems it's fair to say, require a sports medical to be completed annually and then have an emergency card on contact card on file. So um, all of these documents I'll show you um, when Brian finishes up. We do have a Google folder set up with all of the relevant documents um, that we are reviewing tonight and then also relevant to the season in general. Um, so you can access that, download it. Um, we've had some people report issues with that, um, but for the most part it's been very user friendly and efficient, as you can imagine, where you just have a link which you can access, download the form, complete it, um, and then as well, like I said, um, other relevant documents. Um, so when listing this, you, or excuse me, when completing this, you indicate the school name, the sport, so outdoor, uniform, unified outdoor bocce, list all of your student athletes, list whether or not he or she has a disability, it's a simple yes or no, their date of birth, um, and then sign off uh, indicating if uh, ensuring that they've completed the necessary expectations. Um, so this is due um, along with the due to our office, Special Olympics Maryland, along with the affirm, excuse me the applications for participation by Thursday, April sixth. Um, and please do note that that is our deadline. I. Um, underscore that uh, in that your district representative uh, can adjust uh, his or her deadline to then accommodate, have uh, the opportunity to review the forms and then scan them and get them to our office. So please um, know that that is the 
Special Olympics Maryland office deadline, and uh, you can expect um, a few days before, even up to a week before, to get those to your district representative. Okay, that does it for student athletes. Moving on to non student athletes. Um, so, Special Olympics Maryland, being that we work with 21 of 24 school systems statewide, uh, we do realize that every school system has their own means and um, systems in which they vet and properly clear their coaches, paraprofessionals, uh, so on and so forth. But because we work with 21 school systems, we also have a, um, a, a, a responsibility to ensure that our um, the coaches are, all meet the same um, clearances as well. So this is the means in order to do that. Um, you'll see references to coaches because we've been um, that's been a common term, but it actually does in fact apply to all non-student athletes. So that's coaches, paraprofessionals, interpreters, chaperones, um, even team managers, even if they are under the age of 18. So everyone needs to complete this. In order to have um, Class A clearance, which is our term for the proper um, clearances, um, they need to complete uh, two entities. One, they need to um, complete the, for those of you who have been around, it's been a Class A volunteer form. Um, it's been three pages, um, or you can do everything electronically, which is this document here. You can log into our portal, create a registration, create um, your own login, and then it will go through the different entities to complete. Um, and um, so a background check will be completed. You can also, an alternative to the, Brian, if you could scroll down to the next page, an alternative to completing it through the portal, I apologize, um, I'll show you the form. There's a two-page form for Class A volunteers. You can simply complete that and it will go to, uh, and then submit it to your uh, district representative. Um, <clears throat> but everyone does, in fact, regardless if you do have a current background check in Special Olympics Maryland office, everyone does need to complete the protective behaviors training. This is a short video and approximately 10 questions. I don't recall because I, I completed mine back in August. Um, uh, 10 questions and making sure that everyone knows and understands safe practices and that's you know, uh, proper and improper touching, um, having confidential um, and remote conversations, so anything and everything to make sure, again, that we are providing a safe and comfortable environment for our, all participants. Um, the protective behaviors quiz or video and quiz is available on number five in that live link there, so you can complete that. And then the uh, volunteer application um, we'll get to that when we cover the uh, documents that are offered in the Google folder. Um, we do, I will note that we do have two vacancies um, within the program department at Special Olympics Maryland, so two vacancies as regional sports directors. Uh, Nick Anderson and Natalia Steffen are no longer, have moved on to other employment at other nonprofits. Um, so there are, uh, in their absence, please do, if you have any questions about this, um, refer to your uh, district representative um, in the case that he or she is not able to answer those questions. My colleague Rachel Maddock um, at the Special Olympics Maryland office, she is our registration coordinator. Um, she will be happy to help as well. Okay, I think that covers it, Brian. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Melissa. So um, we have the contact information for each district rep as well as the regional sports directors that uh, Melissa just referred to. Um, and just a quick note, if there's anyone on the call who has yet to um, input their information on the coach's contact form or sent out in an email, um, we need you to do that. If you do not have that email or have that link, you can either email Melissa Kelly or myself and we'll be sure to get that to you. So that concludes, oh, you had something Melissa? Yes, let's do it this way. In a follow-up email um, to everyone who registered for the webinar um, and then as well who's on the contact list, we'll follow up with an email um, providing a copy of 
uh, the coach's resource guide, and then also the link to the Google folder in which all of the documents are offered, um, and then as well a link to populate or um, list yourselves um, as the coach for each of the schools. Um, we'll have that in a follow-up email as well as a link to a YouTube uh, video which will be a recording of this session. So you can look for that within the next uh, uh, the next day. Thank you. All right, so this concludes our portion at this time. We can open it up if anyone has any specific questions that they would like to ask. You can unmute your line and ask your question. Uh, just one last thing. Um, Brian, I'm going to take over control. Okay. As I unmute everyone as well, um, we'll be able to take questions here momentarily, but uh, you're looking at my screen at the moment. Uh, this is the Google Drive, uh, Google folder, um, so you can see this, the coach's contact list is here, um, everyone's name, you have the option of listing uh, up to two coaches, if you have a third, you want to receive information, please feel free. Um, it also has the resource guide, the player assessment document, student athlete form, the um, scorecard, so that is the results for matches, um, the non-student athlete form that needs to be completed, the uh, how to complete uh, the class A clearances, student athlete affirmation form, um, how to assemble a bocce court, and the postseason registration. So all of that is there. If you, um, especially those of you who are well tenured, find anything that is not here that would be uh, essential to your season, please have to email me. And I will be happy, Brian or I will be happy to upload it. Um, the good news is, is that we did use this uh, during the indoor bocce season um, and it proved very user friendly um, and uh, efficient. So, for bocce. so, with that, I'll pause, open up for questions. Um, and if you could, if you do have questions, please announce your name, the school uh, that you're with, and uh, proceed. So, um, opening it up for questions now. Thank you. Hi, Melissa. It's Ann Johnson from Queen Anne's. I have a couple of questions. Great. Can. can you hear me? Okay. It's out of yep. noise. Sure can. Um, the gentleman who was earlier was... Um, Made the comment about when a player wants to walk down like the side of a court to assess a play, that yes. they can only come by themselves. Can the coach walk down with them to help them, you know, uh, you know assess a play and then walk and they throw their ball? Brian, do you want to take that? I'm happy to um, yes. Oh, no, you, you can with this. I, I want to make sure it's correct. Please, yes. Um, we invite that opportunity. Um, uh, once a please keep in mind in that scenario specifically, and uh, once a player steps onto the court, he or she may not uh, leave the court. So yeah, right. we may escort together. Um, we realize that sports um, is an opportunity for you to um, talk strategy, you know, courtside that sort of thing, but also an opportunity to um, help them. Uh, with their self-confidence, decision making and such. So we would absolutely invite that. Okay. All right. And another question. The partners class A volunteer um, form. The partners well, I don't know no, it was the form. The part do not register on that, right? That's for the coaches, right? You know, and like paras and aides and things like that, but not the partners of the team. Right, so the, um, the application for participation, um, which I believe is on my screen now, um, this is the form in which all student athletes need to complete. Okay, all right, because Anyone? someone from another, oh, go ahead. What's that? I'm sorry. Someone from 
another school told me that I was supposed to register all my kids on that Class A volunteer form as well. And I said, I didn't think I was to. Right. Um, the scenario we're, we're seeing a lot more of, especially in Bocce, are team managers and such. So team managers do need to complete the Class A clearance. Um, okay. So that is the, I'll pull that out for everyone to see. Is this form, um, and then if someone is under the age of, is a minor, then they would complete the third, the third, third document, if, uh, excuse me. Um, but if anyone's above, over the 18 or older, they just have to do the first two. Okay. And this is the form that is okay. good for three years, um, but the protective behaviors is a new requirement beginning in the fall uh, unified tennis season. So that might not have been completed quite yet. Okay, thank you. Sure. Any other questions? So, Melissa, this is Renee Kinder at Ken Island High School. The form that you have before me right now, that I need my partners to, to sign? No. Um, no. Student athletes. So all student athletes complete the application for participation. The one that lists disabilities? Yes. All of Anyone them. Okay. Not I gave out the wrong forms today. Yay. Uh, anyone who is not playing needs to complete the Class A clearances. Okay. Um, got it. I'm sorry for the confusion there. Okay. So, Melissa, this is uh, Kathy Wiley, Old Mill. If they, com if a, if a volunteer completed that form for tennis, do they need to do it again for bocce? Three years. Yes. Uh, once again, we are. This acts as a permission slip, if you will, for each season. Um, so we need to do that, and then as well, we are aligning ourselves with the expectation of the MPSSA office which also requires a uh, sign-off each and every season. Um, but again, Kathy, if there are hardships um, with um, the um, um, at-home life or what have you, and there are extensive hardships, um, we're willing to uh, make an exception on a case-by-case -case basis on a very rare instance. And this is for the coaches background check form, right? No. Okay, that's the one I'm questioning. Um, if we have a volunteer uh, coach or TSA who's helping out the team and, and went through the process in the fall, do they need to go through that background check again for a bunch? Uh, the background check is current for three years. So okay, if so they do this do form or gone through the SOMB portal, and completed um, the expectations there, um, they are good and current for three years. The okay. protective behaviors training um, is um, oh, a new requirement as of the fall, um, and that is available using this live link here. And we'll reiterate that in the body of the email in the follow up. Melissa, this is Sue Snyder from Cecil County. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question about your legal throws. Sure. Um, I have some students that uh, do not use the legal throws of the underhand toss, and they like to throw it, kind of toss it with a like a basketball uh, throw. Um, would you rather them use a ramp, or is that okay for them? Um, I think that uh, if it's a if it's a necessary form, um, keeping safety and risk uh, at the forefront of our decision here. Um, if it's a necessary throw for them, and there's never any or much of any uh, force or velocity uh, coming off the throw, we would be willing to consider um, an alternative to the underhand release, um, but we would need to note that as an accommodation. That being okay. said, if there is a risk consideration whatsoever, even in the slightest, 
yes, we would prefer that they use a ramp. Okay, that's clear. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? <clears throat> Um, uh, with that, I, again, my name is Melissa Kelly, Senior Director of School Sports Programs. I've been overseeing this program for about four years. So I do want to um, make sure everyone realizes uh, Brian Montgomery, who is leading the presentation tonight, he is the uh, Unified Bocce Chair. He served as the chair for Indoor Bocce this past winter uh, for the Western uh, counties, um, and then he uh, is on board and will serve as uh, the chair for the spring season, outdoor season as well. Um, so Brian is very well tenured. He served as a coach for many years at Wise High School. He's a current physical education uh, teacher at Wise as well, and then he also serves as a district rep. So he's well, uh, very knowledgeable in the sport, um, and we are working together um, in tandem to ensure the proper governance. Um, and implementation. So we do appreciate everyone's um, cooperation, um, especially uh, with Brian with his new role, um, and then as well with the vacancies in our office. So uh, we hope that we will make hires very soon um, for uh, uh, the month uh, uh, at the, the latest um, when forms are due and such, um, but we do appreciate everyone's cooperation. And please do continue to utilize the, um, the communication uh, system that we've instituted, being that coaches will communicate directly to your district representative, uh, and then district representatives will then um, work with our office, be it myself, Brian, or a regional sports director. So um, with that, I will also say that you will receive a follow-up email with the necessary um, access points to both the Google folder and then the coaches contact list. Um, but please do um, wish you the best of luck in the start of your season. Many of you have already started practices, so it's, uh, it's one of our most exciting seasons um, with over 800 student athletes in years past participating. So we look forward to uh, having you all yet again. Um, and as we nail down the dates for the district tournaments, uh, those will be announced as well. So, uh, Brian, anything else? Nope, I believe that's all. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Great. Thank you again, everyone. Signing off. Have a good evening. Thank, Thank you, you, Brian. Too. Thank you. Thank you, Brian and Melissa. <clears throat>